the thing with committing to be the best is committing to improve in the trade until you're so good at it that you don't have to ever double or doubt yourself, right? So basically, if you live your life through committing to be the best at anything you touch, then you're never half-assing something. You understand what I mean? Like I never go into business saying something is not possible or this doesn't happen or it doesn't work that way. Instead, I find a way to becoming so good at it that I can make it work that way. Today's guest is the serial entrepreneur, self-made millionaire, and best-selling author of the Third Circle Theory, Pejman Gadimi. Going from poor immigrant to the senior vice president of a Fortune 500 bank when he was only 23 years old, and then later founding multiple seven-figure businesses in different industries, this guy is the real deal when it comes to creating success and building an empire. So PJ, welcome to the show. I appreciate you having me on, buddy. And I'm super excited to have you. And I just have to say, like, diving into your story was just mind-blowing. As you know, listening to you going from, you know, overcoming obstacles and obstacle and obstacle and going from success to success then through that at such a young age was so inspiring. So what, where did that drive come from, uh, for, come from for you from like, you know, such an early age on to hustle, to first make money and then later, you know, build this legacy for yourself? Well, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a drive, man. It was just running away. I mean, I know it sounds weird, but the one thing I did as a child that a lot of people don't do, I ran away from poverty. I hated fucking poverty. I hated not having money. I hated living with a single mother that struggled to make money. I didn't like the fact that I watched other people be rich and I wasn't rich. But instead of being angry towards them for having the things I didn't have, I was angry towards myself for not figuring out how to do anything because I had no money. So I just wanted to make sure I wasn't poor. That was my only drive. It was like, if I live one day, then how much money can I make today? And if the answer was $10, then the question was, could I make $11 tomorrow? Could I make $12 tomorrow? And it didn't matter if it was a dollar more or a hundred more, as long as it was more, right? Then I was less poor the next day. So, so, so what did money mean at this time for you? Like, was it freedom? Or what did that, why was that so important? Yeah. It was basically, we lived in a basement. I mean, I had nothing. I saw the kids have shit. I didn't even have a green card to work. So I had nothing, like meaning like I had no opportunity, no chance to do well, right? And the thing was, it, it, money just meant having shit and not not having shit. Meaning <laughs> like it meant having a house, you know, like not even like a nice house, like a fucking normal house. It meant not living in a basement. It meant having a bed, not just a mattress. And the point was that it wasn't even about like how much money could I make? How quickly could I make it? It was just about... I didn't even have the basic essence of what I deemed to be a healthy state of survival. Wow. So, so it's really just about surviving sort of thing in the, in the beginning. I mean, isn't it for everybody? Why do you, why do you work? You work to make money so you can eat. Why do you want to make more money than eating? Cause you want a place. Why do you want to make more money than having a place and eating? Cause you want stuff like you want a car and it keeps progressing. Right. And the more your survival needs are met, the more you progress towards your desires. So you take your needs away and you go, what is it that I needed? I have that. What is it that I want? Do I have that? Okay, then what do I want to change in the world? Can I do that? And that's how basically the transition of a human being works. Yeah, for sure. So, so what point do you, do you think you, you sort of achieved that level where you could you know, stop focusing on the money and start creating your legacy? I think that uh, I was about 20, was I 20? Yeah, I was about 29 years, no, 30 years old when I retired from my first company and I still own it, but I retired from working in it. And I decided instead that I would work on what I wanted the next 50 years of my life to look like. And it wasn't about, I wanted more money. I wanted a bigger company. Instead it was, I wanted to teach online. So I wanted to come up with a way to create that value so that I could teach online. And so I started kind of working towards that, knowing that I would lose money knowing that I would probably not make nearly as much money as I was making before and knowing that I just didn't give a shit. I think that's how I knew. <laughs> so tell because me about, I had everything I wanted, you know? So tell me about secret entourage that, that mentoring platform that you've created for entrepreneurs. Like wh what do you try to create with that really? So I'm, I'm actually, it's almost over meaning that secret entourage about 
two years ago stopped being as popular. Uh, part of that was because uh, a lot of people said that, like, you have to understand it this way. When we started Secret Entourage, it was 2008. In 2008, none of you had podcasts. None of you were doing interviews. Nobody existed, meaning yeah. I don't think didn't exist. All the cartoon characters like Dan Locke didn't exist. All that existed was an idea, which was that I thought it was a good idea to do stories of people who had exotic cars and what they did for a living. Because one yeah. of the things that happened in my town was always, everybody would ask me, you drive a Lamborghini. What do you do for a living? Like, how do you <laughs> young? How do you do it? So it's like Ty Lopez in his garage kind of thing. <laughs> right. But this was before he existed, right? Mm -hmm. Like years before he existed. So I thought to myself, I said, well, let me do a story on what do people do? You know, like, who are they? And it got really popular and it got really good. And we started a university out of it, which was a secret entourage academy, teaching people business entrepreneurship from the minds of others who have done great things. And the problem became that then the Ty Lopez's of the world came. And the Ty Lopez's of the world, they weren't bad. Like they, were, they didn't matter that what they were teaching because they weren't doing shit. They were just marketers. But the basic key that kind of fucked everything up is Ty Lopez and the cartoon character crew of like the Dan Locks and the, monk, the, the other monkeys that fucking fuck everything up for everybody. <laughs> All they did is they came into the space polluting the space. Meaning they created products and infomercial products that were garbage. They guided people towards the wrong kind of hope. And as a result, because they put so much money behind their marketing, they polluted the environment that these types of businesses could grow in. And so, you know, as a whole, this really hurt the idea of what Secret Entourage was, you know? And so that's when we kind of reshaped Secret Entourage to be more about helping only those that want to be helped rather than helping the masses because we realized that while we wanted to help the masses, it was just going to be a much more uh, ineffective thing to do from a cost basis. And because they were kind of polluting the space, it was going to make it much more expensive to do that. And since to us, Secret Entourage was never a money maker, it was never about making money. It was always about changing the world. It just became like not something we could pursue at the same rate we were pursuing it. No, for sure. That makes so much sense. And I really feel like nowadays you can't scroll through Instagram feed without seeing like 10 pop-ups, right? For like, yeah, take exactly. this course and take that. Like the, the, the market is so swamped, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, and 90% so, of that market is bullshit. Yeah. And that, that's why I think it's so important to, to still have your, voice heard, like, to have your voice heard, right? If you're providing like real value, high quality value. Correct. Right? Yep. I think that's so important to, for people to have this kind of platform that they can access and they can find the right information. Yep. Correct. So, so for those people, you know, that come to your platform, that work for you, that you've, you know, interviewed and all that, what do you see as sort of the most common characteristics of success? Like, what are some of the things that you find actually help people, you know, build these businesses they want? I think the biggest and really simplest road to finding a successful either business, career, or anything else, regardless that you work for people, who own your own business, or have a big brand or whatever it is is the commitment to what it is you're preaching. So a lot of people get into a business because of what they think they can make money in. Like, so they go, I want to make money trading stocks. So I'm going to learn how to be a stockbroker, right? They don't say, I want to learn to be a stockbroker. And by becoming the best stockbroker, I'm going to make a lot of money. So basically, they're only in it for the money they can make in it. And if the problem with that is that it, it takes 10 years to become the best at something. It doesn't take three, it takes 10. Yeah. So if you don't have 10 years to commit to something, then it's not that you're not going to make any money in it. You're just not going to be the best at it. So you're never going to turn the rules from you chasing money to money chasing you. And so because of that reason, it's very difficult for people who don't commit to a trade to find extraordinary success monetarily in anything they do. Yeah, that makes so much sense. So, so how, how do you find that passion? And for people listening to this, we have a lot of, you know, students and at that sort of age listening to this, how do you find that passion that then, you know, you're willing to stick through those 10 years, whatever it it's takes to, to actually become great? Maybe that's the problem is that we think it is about passion when it's not. 
it's about commitment. You don't have to love something to death to do it for 10 years. Sometimes you can love the process of it. You can love the marketing of it. You can love the transaction of it. You don't have to love the whole thing. It, to give you an example, like when, when I started like in, in my first business, VIP motoring, I didn't love cars like believe it or not i enjoy cars but i didn't love cars like most people do like they live and die for cars you yeah. know they love that stuff i really didn't give a shit but you know what i loved i loved the money and the thing was i was teaching people to manage money and i didn't care that it was watches cars or art i just understood that it was the idea that i was managing money so if i enjoy the management of money i don't have to be i wasn't passionate about cars i wasn't passionate about what i was doing but I understood the need in the marketplace and I was willing to commit not to the passion, but to the idea that I was willing to commit to becoming really good at it. So just like when I started in banking, I had a career in banking. I was doing really well and I didn't, I wasn't passionate about banking. I hated it. I hated it. Wow. I remember really? the, first, the first day I went to work, I cried and I went home because I was like pissed and I was wow. like, why the fuck did I switch jobs? I took a pay cut to be here. I hate it. I hated it. But reality is it didn't matter because I had committed to it. And the point was, if I committed to being at a job, then I was going to become the best at it. So I got my shit together and I said, it doesn't matter how much I like or dislike something. I'm going to commit to this and I'm going to make it work. Get it? And wow, so I mean, yes. no, I absolutely love that. So, so, so I'm, I'm really trying to understand this. Like what are sort of the criteria used then? Like you, you change careers, right? And you've had several like different careers already in life. So you change career and you commit in the beginning, like I want to be the best, right? I want to go to the top, right? When, when well, is no, sort of that's different. Well, that's different. Going to the top and committing to be the best have no correlation. Understand that. Understand that the thing with committing to be the best is committing to improve in the trade until you're so good at it that you don't have to ever double or doubt yourself, right? So basically, if you live your life through committing to be the best at anything you touch, then you're never half-assing something. You understand what I mean? Like I never go into a business saying something is not possible or this doesn't happen or it doesn't work that way. Instead, I find a way to becoming so good at it that I can make it work that way. I think one of the big things with committing is understanding that when you commit to a business or career or something, you have to commit to things that are extensions of who you are, not things that are just like cool or rich or going to be uh, of great abundance. Instead, you have to commit to the fact that, for example, maybe you're very good in leadership or in management. You have to find a job or a career or even a business that uses your management skills and uses your leadership skills so it allows you to become really good at it, get it? And a lot of times people don't think that way. So when they, when they go apply for a job, you look like a young guy, so I'm sure you've had people tell you they apply for jobs places. You may have applied for a job somewhere at some point in your life. Yeah. So when you go apply for a job, most people say, you, 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 they kind of look at the situation and they go, what can I get out of this job? They go, can I get, how much money can I get? How many days off do I get? What days do I have to work? Does the schedule work for my pay, right? All of these things go in their head. The first question they should be asking themselves is not what can a job do for me, but rather what can I do for these people? Meaning they need to be asking themselves, how will my presence increase and help this business be better? What am I bringing wow. to the table? And if they do that, then first off, one thing's gonna happen they're gonna get much better at convincing the person at the other side of the desk why they need to get hired, right? And then two, that person across the desk is going to pay you more money to do the same job because they understand that you are a very good fit for that job and not just any fit. Because you see, one of the things people don't understand is when employers pick people, they usually look at it and they go, hey, why do you wanna work here? And someone goes, well, I wanna do this, I wanna do that. You know, like this is pretty much like, and my life is about, I want to be CEO of this. I want to be yeah. like, all this bullshit doesn't mean anything. You know, uh, I'm a great leader at heart and all that shit. But then when you really turn around and really ask the person, what can you do for me? They don't know what to say. They just stop, they freeze. They go, I don't, what do you mean for you? I want to work for you. But it's like, <laughs> everybody wants to work for me. The question is, what can you do for me? 
And someone says, well, I have great skills in tech. I can build you incredible websites. The question is, okay, can I provide you an environment where you can create incredible websites? If the answer is yes, do you have the talent to create incredible websites? If the answer is yes, then it's a funding principle where two people meet and incredible creativity comes to life. And that is what ends up happening that makes things successful, you know? Wow, I, I love this. And if I'm getting you right here, it's really about going away from the selfish perspective of what can I get? And it's like going to the serving mode almost, right? Of like, what can I deliver? How can I bring more value to the no, table? No, it's not, well, it's not serving. It's the ability to understand that what it is that it's, ha like, what is a company paying for? They're not paying for your body to be at work. They're paying for your talent. Like, so, so when, when Google hires a person, they don't pay them to show up in an office and sit there and look at the wall. Yeah. They're paying them because of what they can do, right? So when you work for someone, you are being selfish no matter what. Just so you understand that. A lot of people don't realize that. They go, oh, why would I want to work for someone, build someone else's dreams? Have you heard that? Like, yeah. People say that all the time. But no one, no one in this world has ever worked for someone else. You know why? Because in the end, even if they work in a company, then all they're doing is they're trading their time for money. But they are doing it because they want something out of it not because someone else wants them to build a dream because they don't have real skills and real talents that are worth paying for. So they go get a job instead. When they learn that skill and talent, the job pays them even more money because they say, Hey, you've got great skills. You're really good at this. We're going to pay you 10 times more money to do this again. Here's the difference though. They go, well, I'm building someone else's company and dream. That's not true. If you knew how to build your own dream, you would be building it already. You're simply exchanging your time for money because you need money. You want money to do what? To buy the things you want, to buy the house you want, the cars you want, the, the lifestyle you want, the freedom you want. Whose dream are those things? Is it your employer? Does your employer dream of what car you drive? Of course not. You dream of what car you drive and you earn the money to buy it. So you are always and have always been building your dream even when you work at McDonald's. The problem is that most people are too fucking stupid to understand that. So they get lost in this idea that if I work for someone and they're telling me what to do, then, then I'm not in a great position in my life. And that's not true. I know people, I had a job that was paying me six figures a year and a seven figure bonus. I was making more money in my job than most people make in their companies after working 10 years. Does that mean that I should have quit my job because I wanted to build my own dream? I had my dream. I had a Lamborghini while I worked a job. I had a beautiful house. I had these things. Why would I think ever that the, the person I worked for gave a shit if I drove a Lamborghini, a Ferrari, or a <laughs> Honda Civic? They don't. I did. And I worked to get the things I had. So I never worked for anybody because in the end, I was the only one that ever benefited from whatever it was that was available. Well, I absolutely love that sort of breakdown of how we really sort of are able to choose our lives more, more clearly, right? Once we understand this. So I absolutely love that. And so I want to take us back for a moment to, you know, your story of how you, you know, came to us in the beginning and it really started your career. So you actually came from France, right? No money, no, no resources whatsoever. So mm -hmm. how do you get started in that, in that beginning when you had nothing, like just you know, looking for jobs and then rising up the ladder sort of thing? How, how do you approach that whole thing? Was it with this like value adding like mentality from the start? Just they don't want to be poor. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's really simple. If you, if you work a job and you make $10 an hour, your job is to find another job that pays you $12 an hour and to get really good at that job so you can get 16 an hour. I didn't have any special mentality. My only mentality was that I didn't want to be poor. And so if I worked a day, then I, it was better for me to earn $1 than $0. So when I couldn't get a job, if I, I went to try to start a car wash business, I washed cars for $5 a car, $5. You can't even get wow. a car wash at a fucking charity for less than $15, yeah? <laughs> $5. People said to me, why do you only charge $5? Like, why not $10? Why not $15? Good business means you can charge $20. But I said, $5. And they said, why? And I said, because 
I don't have one dollar. So if I can charge you five, I have five more dollars. Wow. And they said, well, wait a minute, but well, you could have 10. Mm. I said, I would rather guarantee I have five when I have zero than maybe get 10. Plus, if I charge you five and I can wash 10 cars in a day, I made $50. But if I can charge 10 and I don't get five customers, then I could lose the opportunity to make $50. I'm not afraid of the work. I'm afraid of missing out on actually making money by losing time. So even at 14, I understood that the more time I lost, the more money I would lose. So I always wash cars. And so I started making decent money washing cars. Wow, that's so interesting. This, this mentality of like guaranteeing sort of that you make as much as possible, right? In like every single day. So then, you know, when you, when you went to high school, right? You were like working as a telemarketer, um, also already becoming really successful at that, right? So, so, I mean, I took a job as a telemarketer because uh, I had a company that was willing to give me a job and they didn't know, but I didn't have a green card, <laughs> but they still hired me not knowing, you know? You and just so never told I, them? <laughs> well, no, I gave them, uh, like, I figured out a trick to getting a school permit. So they never asked for a year and a half later. And then I was already in the door, you know? Oh, wow. So it was already too late. So basically, uh, when I started that job, I went in it with the idea that I had to make phone calls, which was a telemarketing job. And it was paying 12 an hour. And remember, my mentality is I'd rather make 12 an hour than wash a car for $5 an hour. For sure. So it's better to make 12. So I got that job. I hated it, but it didn't matter. I had to get really good at it. So I worked, I was supposed to work from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. every night. I went in at 2 p.m. right after high school and I worked for free from two to five to learn basically how to become a good telemarketer. Wow. And then from five to nine to actually make calls. And so after I remember it was maybe like eight months after I started, uh, I went from making $12 an hour to making $2,500 a week in commission. So then, then I was making, remember, I was like 15 years old and I'm making $10,000 a month. You know? <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, so I, was, I went from poor to making 10K a month and basically I used that money to help me leverage myself up even more. You know? So you started investing it sort of back in that, that automobile business or? No, I just started actually helping my mom survive you know i said time to move into our own house time to you know get like basically like a not live in a basement anymore yeah like, for sure furniture you know oh, i didn't need like a lot of shit but i was like let's get shit going and so we slowly worked through that and uh kept working and kept working and as a result of it some months i had like 5k months some months i had like 15k months and it kept going but i kept getting promoted so by the end of 18 i was running that entire company. So, which was really good for me because I had a green card by then. I was running this company. I had leadership skills, customer service skills, sales skills. And then in uh, the fall, like once I got all that, uh, that leverage, cause I learned all these things, I wanted to kind of go, go and do something else. Cause I didn't like that business. It wasn't something I wanted to do. I was selling roofs, siding and windows. I didn't like it. I thought it was horrible. Uh, but I was good at it. So I said, how can I use my skills somewhere else? And I had a friend uh, of my mom's that worked in a bank and she thought it would be cool if I worked in a bank with her. So I said, uh, sure, I'll come and what should I do? And she said, you can be in sales. And I said, I don't want to be in sales. You don't pay enough. You pay 30K a year. I'm making 80, 90K a year. Why would I want to come and take a 50K pay cut? And so I went and convinced one of her friends to hire me as a bank manager and I became the youngest bank manager at the age of 18. And then wow. I started. And you had like no experience up to that point, like whatsoever? I, well, I had sales experience. Mm -hmm. service but, but, experience yeah. mm -hmm. No banking experience. And yes. I didn't have a banking degree and I didn't have a finance degree. I didn't even go to college. <laughs> so I just literally spent six months studying how the banks worked, how they made money. So when I went to my interview, I knew exactly what to say so that someone hires me. Love this. So you're willing to actually put in the time and, and invest in yourself and, and study basically. Well, basically that's what people don't do, right? Like go yeah. ask so many people that go apply, like think about it this way. Let's say someone comes to me and goes, PJ, can you mentor me? That happens all the time, right? It's like, they see me on Instagram. They see 20 cars on my profile. They see a big house. They go, show me the way <laughs> PJ mentor me. And I ask people one question they can never answer. I say, why? 
why do you want me to mentor you? And every one of their responses is about themselves. I'm hardworking. I'm, I'm super smart. I'm really good at this. I'm that. It's never about, like, you ask something of somebody else, right? You ask someone to mentor you. What are you going to do for them is the first question you need to answer. You're asking for something for free. But then when you ask that person, like, why should I mentor you? They tell you more about what they're going <laughs> to get out of it, right? So you hmm. see, like, people are so lost that, again, they're not understanding that the world works on a give and take basis. So if you're asking for something, you have to be providing something in return. And when sure. you're asking someone to mentor you and you go, I'm really good at this, then I usually ask them, I say, wait, why do you want me to mentor you? And they say, well, because you're rich. <laughs> well, how do, you, how do you know that I'm rich? Like, if you don't know who I am, how do you know if A, I can mentor you in what you want to learn, B, that I even made my own money? What if my parents gave me money? What if I was born a millionaire, right? What if I was yeah. born a three-year-old millionaire? Why would you want me to mentor you? And this is what people aren't willing to do. You see, they're not even willing to pick up the internet and put someone's name in Google to learn something about them before they reach out to them. But I was willing to invest six months, literally out of my life, to go back and forth into this job that I had no knowledge of getting, maybe had a chance of getting, to learn everything about banking and that bank so that maybe, maybe they would give me a chance to work there. That's wow. the difference. I love this, this willingness to prepare, like you say, right? And it's, it's so true. Like nowadays, I feel like even, you know, like people coming in for like job interviews for whatever, right? I used to work in HR and what I've realized is so many times, like people just weren't prepared whatsoever, right? Like they don't tell even me know about the company, they don't tell me about the, the job. Like they don't know anything, right? They don't know the job. They don't know the company. They don't even know who the person they're going to work for is. Yeah. Like they, you know how many people go to a job interview going, oh yeah, I Googled your company. <laughs> and I go, and I go, did you Google me? Yeah. Well, no. Are you going to work for my company or for me? Hmm. Well, you're the company. Exactly. So who gives a shit what sign is on the door if you don't know who you're going to work for? But yet, you know, you want to work there. Why? Because you want to make money. Get it? Yeah. You're not worried about anything other than yourself. So you're always going to do what's best for yourself without ever thinking about that what's best for you is perhaps to start understanding why you do what you do instead of just doing it because you think it's the right thing to do. No, I absolutely love that. I think this, this way of over-preparing, literally stalking that person that's you know, gonna interview you, right? Like learning about the interest, learning like what do they want from you, right? It's so important. So- well, people, people don't do any research on anything, right? No, for sure. No, so, so you mentioned, you know, you went to this bank, you started from, from sort of the bottom again, right? After basically running this whole company. And then you started just getting promoted and promoted and promoted. So what was it like that, that allowed you? Was it again, like sort of just adding value or, or what no, allowed same, you to? Same thing, bro. I just came in. Thing, to, just, I came into work two hours work. early. Hmm. I left three hours after. So I could wow. learn hmm. to be a better banker when everybody else was worried about what vacation time they took. I worked, I remember this specifically. I worked four years in a row with one day off a year. Wow four years in a row with one day off a year because I learned something in life, which uh, really always resonated with me. Someone once told me you can't outsmart people when they've been doing their thing for 10 years. You know, you can't outsmart mm. someone who's been doing this for 10 years. Like they're better at you because they know they've seen, they've conquered, but you can outwork them because they're lazy now, meaning they've done it long enough that they don't work as hard. So the only way you can beat competitors, which sometimes competitors are just other employees who want the same jobs. Mm. They're smarter. They've been doing it for a longer time. They know the business better than you because they've been doing it for 10 years and you've been doing it for three months. But they can't, if, if you can outwork all your competition, you will always beat your competition because you will grow faster, learn more and catch up to them. And then you will have the attitude to continue doing that. And they will have to readjust and will lose that race. Love this. So, so, so listening to you, it sounds like there's really no secret to it, right? It's literally just going out there and doing the work day after day, isn't it? 
Well, you, there is maybe shortcuts, but I always said in my life, if I haven't traveled the path, why would I worry about the shortcut? Yeah. Right? Everybody wants the easy way to get there. I always looked at it as I would rather get there than get lost trying to find the shortcut. Yeah, that's, that is so important. No, totally. And I was, I was in this situation for a long time. I was just trying to look for shortcuts all the time rather than actually doing anything. So mm -hmm. I think this is, this is such an important point here. For sure. Now, let's transition now to the third circle theory, your best-selling book. Um, can you share with us a little bit about the three circles and how we can sort of start to implement those in our lives? The three circles are very simple. It's circle one is the mastery of circumstance. Circle two is the mastery of society. Circle three is the master of life. Every human goes through these three stages. Basically circumstance, uh, then followed by uh, society and followed by life. If every single human understands that, then they will absolutely find, uh, absolutely find a lot of leverage in their life. Because you see, we're all born into circumstance, meaning we're born sometimes with poor parents, rich parents, uh, maybe controlling parents, maybe abusive parents, maybe in a bad country, whatever it is. We can't control that, right? We're children. We don't control what the hell happens to us. What we can do is understand that as we grow, we have to make sure we don't become victims of feeling sorry for what we have, right? We can't say, I'm poor. I am fucking sucks that I was born poor. Instead, we got to look at it and say, it's just part of life. It is what it is. Now I got to overcome it, right? So never being a victim in life is the key to graduating the first circle. The second circle is about separating society from life. A lot of people, uh, a lot of people say basically that if you're successful in society, in your job or in money or everything else, you're successful in life. And that's not always true. Yeah. We know a lot of people who are very monetarily successful, who are very poor, right? Mentally they struggle, they're very sad, they don't have everything they want in life, and they have $10 million, you know? So why does that happen? Because that person never separated society and life. To them, success was driven about how others felt about them. Meaning that if others said, oh, great job, you get $10 million, oh, you're rich, oh, you're cool, let me make you feel good about your life. Those are the people who get trapped in this constant need for reaffirmation that their money is a reason why they've been successful. Then on the other hand, there's people that understand that there's a separation of money and life. But there's two types of people. People either jump early and say, fuck money. I don't need money to be successful. And I'm going to go and have a very successful life. And they usually fail miserably. And there's people who understand that first they have to learn to make money, make it, but then not just stop there. Stop themselves and say, now comes the time where I've bought my time back. And I want to now spend the rest of my life creating value for myself. Wow. Make sense? Yeah. So, so money, is that really just for leverage then over time or? Yes. Yeah. No money. I mean, it is leverage, but it's the leverage on time. Hmm. The more money you have, the more of your time you own. So if you make your first million dollars, you own the next five years of your life. If you make your first $10 million, you own the next 50 years of your life. The basic point is that if you're 20 years old and you have, $10 million, you're pretty much safe until you're 70 years old. Get it? Yeah. So you can so basically explore and like create and do whatever, you, do whatever you, want. you want. You can focus on what you want to do, not what you have to do. Right? Like you have the leverage to create resources. You have the leverage to be able to employ people, bring talent together. You have the leverage of traveling, opening your eyes to new places. This is what money does is it opens up this opportunity of owning your time on this earth once more to whatever you want it to be. Yeah, I absolutely love that. that that's a lesson I had to learn in a, in a very, very harsh way because my first business started, right? And like, I was renting out this office and I just like ended up running out of money because I hadn't saved enough in the beginning. And so I, I love this point. Like you need to have enough money oftentimes to start that big dream that you have, right? Otherwise you're just gonna Sometimes like run out. dreams have nothing to do with making money. You know, like I wanted to always teach but when I was younger, I knew that if I teach in schools or if I became a kindergarten teacher, I would be poor. Yeah. I was like, I want to be rich. Then I want to teach. <laughs> so I would rather be the owner of a school than the teacher who teaches under someone else's rule. Get it? Mm -hmm, for sure. Yeah. So, so that made more sense to me than just teaching because I want to teach. So a lot of kids today, they only look at what they want. You know, they go, 
oh, I want to work here because it's cool. I want to do this because I like it. They don't say like, what do I want to do in 10 years? What do I need to do now so that in 10 years I can start that instead of just keep on doing this? And then they would get the jobs that would actually help them get closer to their longer goals. The problem is most kids don't have longer goals. Yeah, so it sounds like this, this sort of long-term, really 10-year vision, whatever it is, like is so important in allowing us to really direct our lives, right? Well, how can you know if a job is the right job to take for you if you don't know where you want to be in 10 years? Yeah. Someone says like, oh, I want to, I want to build this billion-dollar business in 10 years. I go, okay. What job do you need now to help you do that? What's the business going to be? Oh, I don't know. I just know it's 10 billion. <laughs> how do you know? How do you not know? How do you associate money to a business you don't know? How do you even consider starting a business, a goal, when you don't know what business to start? People think owning a business is awesome. Owning a business sucks. It's constant work. It's zero mental freedom. It's constant headaches. It's constant liability. Why? Because something has to be worth it somewhere. So when people say, what, when they ask others, what business should I start? This is such a horrible question to ask someone because nobody knows you as good as you know yourself. How can I answer what business should you start if I don't know your talents, your skills, your experience level, your commitment level? Like, how am I supposed to tell you? Like, <laughs> hey, uh, get in the car business. What does that mean? I don't know. It seems like a good business to be in because maybe you're making money in it, so it's got to be good. That doesn't mean anything. Any, there is money in every business in the world. It's a question of who and how you want to make it within it. So if someone says, do you want to be in the garbage business? Not really. Is there money in it? I'm sure there is. Someone comes to me and goes, hey, I got a billion dollar idea. It's about this amazing thing that's like food related. And I go, I don't care. And they go, but I guarantee you it's a billion dollar idea. And I go, okay, first off, you can't guarantee me it's a billion dollar idea because you've never built a billion dollar idea. Secondly, it's in the food space. I'm not in the food space. So I don't really care about the food space. So someone goes, yeah, but we're going to make a lot of money in it. I go, no, we are not. Someone who's in the food space could do really good at that. Mm -hmm. Me and you are not because I'm not in the food space, nor do I give a shit, and nor are you a talent in the food space. Get it? So just because there's money in places doesn't mean that's where you should go to do it. Yeah, so it sounds like we, we need to go look in the inside first, right? To try to figure out like, what are our talents, our abilities, our interests, right? And then, then go out and look at like, how does, like what I have to offer sort of match what the world sort of provides us, right? Yep. Love that. Now, PG, on the show, we always love to celebrate failure as a stepping stone to building character and building resilience in our life. So do you have throughout your career or life a uh, favorite failure? I've never, I've never failed. Do you know why? Because you've learned. Yeah. Because I've never given up. Yes. But I can tell you that the only time in my life where I felt like a failure, I hadn't failed. I just didn't understand what was happening in my life. Is when I lost my job in banking, I spent a good maybe a couple of months like trying to understand what I wanted to happen in my life. And one of the biggest mistakes I had made when I was in banking, when I worked for other people, you know, like in that job, was the big mistake I made was the same one that I told you at the beginning. Nobody works for somebody else. And you see the whole beginning of my life, I believe that I work for other people. And I trusted other people. And I said that these other people are the reason I'm going to become successful or not. You know, it's my relationships with them. When in reality, I was always the reason I would be successful or not. And I fired myself. I was the one that made whatever things I've done in my life happen or not happen. And I think that one of the big failures when I got fired was that I believed that I was, someone had betrayed me. You know, I gave them my everything and they betrayed me. And reality was they never betrayed me. All they did was do what they would have always done from the beginning. And I did what I would have always done from the beginning, which is look out for themselves and I looked out for myself. And so when I, when I kept that grudge, uh, when I kept that grudge, uh, that's what happened. So what I'm saying is that basically when I got fired, I gave up this idea that I worked for other people. And I realized that I've always worked for myself. And when I took that responsibility, I decided that I was going to go focus on building a business that was going to provide me value 
and not provide long-term value for somebody else. And so I started my other company. Yeah, love, absolutely love that. Now, Peter, we talked about a lot of things today in this, this show. Um, if you could give our listeners one piece of advice, you, you talked about being a teacher before, one piece of homework, right? What would be that one thing they should you know, do to build the business they desire? I think one of the basic and most common things one should do uh, is really understand that a business is an extension of your talents. If you don't have a reason or function in a business, you shouldn't be in that business. Meaning like if you don't have a reason to be in that business, like you don't have a skill or a talent to bring to that business, you're never going to find long-term success in it. So you have to move forward. And I think a lot of people get stuck on this idea that again, they want businesses that are going to make the money. They don't want to figure out how to be really good at a business. So instead of asking which business should I be in, start asking yourself, what am I willing to do that I'm willing to work 10 years to get really good at? And then whatever that is, then let me know. Absolutely love that. Now, before I ask my final question, where can listeners connect with you online? What's your favorite social media platforms, websites, whatever it is? To connect with me, the best way to do it is go on Instagram. I create millionaires is my, hash, is my uh, actual handle. You can also find me on learnfrompj.com. Uh, and you can also uh, find me specifically on pejmangademy.com. There you can find all my courses, all the different things I do. And of course, connect with me on social media. Awesome. Going to put the links up there in the show notes then. Now, my final question, what is your quest for greatness? So what is that big vision that you have for the rest of your life that you want to build until the day you die? Uh, nothing. Nothing? Nothing. That's right. <laughs> you see, I live my life to be great every day based on my capacity as a human. And I don't worry about what the next 50, 60, 70 years are going to be like or what I'm going to work to die for i don't live to work i i live for not the impact i make on others but for the reputation i leave behind once i leave so my work for my books the things i teach uh when it comes to third circle theory radius uh the third installment that's coming out soon as well is basically focused on helping human beings have a better understanding of how to be human beings this is not just my purpose, but it's my accepted choice as to what I am here to do. Now, am I gonna die doing it? I don't know that I want to die doing something like that. I think that I prefer having created the work and then work uh, as long as it is physically and humanly possible to help others discover that work. But I don't think that I look at life through these extremes that are you know, this is what I'm trying to do till the end of my life. I am living my life and I'm doing the things necessary to be successful at what I do.